So how do we decenter ourselves? Because I think that's really important. Okay, when we're thinking about what it looks like when we're ha- when we hold all the power as let's say you're in a classroom and you're teaching, right? So we have to keep in mind about the compliance versus communication. If I'm in power and I ask my students a question, am I going to get the answer? A truthful and honest answer. I mean, think about it from your position as an adult. Let's say your boss is your principal, or let's just say you're working in a position where you have a supervisor. And we don't want to hurt our supervisor's feelings, or maybe they have not created a space in order for us to feel comfortable to tell the good, honest truth. They say, how am I leading? Or, or how was that staff meeting last week? Oh, yeah, it was great. Good job. Maybe deep down inside, we don't think so. A lot of our students feel the same way. They may not feel comfortable with sharing. You know what? Uh, honestly, I didn't like the class last week. Or honestly, I don't like the class at all. Well, I don't think we have a good com- good, re- re- uh, good relationship. Students aren't going to may not want to tell you that kind of stuff because they know, well, if I say something, my teacher may retaliate and I might fail this class or I might fail my next test and I need to to do well in order for me to get scholarships or be able to qualify for this or qualify for that. So if I ask how their day is going, for example, I might be well-intentioned However, because I hold a certain a level of power, is that student going to tell me the truth? Going back to the idea of when we teach in a certain way where it's like, this is the rules, I'm your teacher, I'm telling you what you need to learn, and then there's no participation beyond just uh, taking notes or soaking up all the information that we're instilling upon our students. We're not learning from them. It's not a collaborational style that can cause challenges, which leads me to my next point. We need to allow our students to check us. And what do you mean by check? You know, that's being rude or disrespectful. Well, here's the thing. I learned this a f- couple years ago. That the just a simple phrase of saying "I invite you." Very simple. I invite you students, if you disagree or if you need more time, if you don't like this assignment, if you don't like how the class is going, I invite you to share with me. Creating that space for our students to know or feel comfortable with, hey, teacher, let me talk to you. I, I, I have some concerns with regards to the content. Or I would love to, add, wouldn't it be cool or do you mind or could we add in this or that? I just read this book at home. Could we bring it into the classroom? Now, if you notice, I put in your body language is important, right? Because we can say this all we want. You know, I invite you or we can put it in our syllabus. It says, you know, please, I really value your feedback, blah, blah, blah. We say these words. But how does our action reflect those words? Is our body language in Synchron, oh, well, in sync. Is our body language in sync with what we say? If a student calls us out and says, hey, teacher, I, 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 I'm not a fan of this. Are we, are we crossing our arms? Is our, is our body language shifting? Is, are are, are we, we huffing and puffing? Even though we just said, oh, we invite you and all these things. But are we able to, again, do what we say. Actions literally can speak louder than words. The last one we had to keep in mind is reality is relative. That's right. Reality is relative. What, is, what does that mean? Right? Here's the thing. Our schools are in communities. Now, a lot of us do live in the communities that we're serving. Some of us do not. We could live literally two doors down from one of our students. We could share the same racial identities, the same gender, those kind of things. But what goes on in their home is going to be different than what goes on in your home. So even if we live on on the same street or share similar backgrounds, 
their lived experiences and reality is not going to be the same as yours. Now, why is that important? Well, at the end of the day, our students will opt into learning. If somehow we can demonstrate that what we're teaching can help them craft a better reality. Not only that, is if we're able or mindful or, or in tuned to what our students are, are, you know, what they care about, what they like and their interests, not only that, but a lot of our students will be more engaged if their learning allows them to do something for people that they love. I always look forward to when, when my kids were younger, they had Father's Day or, or certain gift, like the teachers would have the students, have my kids put together some sort of arts and crafts. They do it for their mom, they do it for me, right? Um, because, the kid, and I see how the kids go all out on these projects because they're doing something for somebody that they love. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing something for my community, I'm bringing in a project for the students to do and it's for the community, they love their community. They love their neighborhood stores. There are certain, you know, the clubs, the organization that they go to after school. And they're doing something to support them. Yeah, they're gonna they're, they're gonna enjoy that. But sometimes people will stop right at the same, stop at the idea of, well, you know, I have similar background as my students, so I know what they need. But again, there's not that participation from our students. We have to collaborate with them as well.